Hi there, so today I'm going to do a brief recap of some issues uh, presented on the Monday 13th of February 2017 edition of Q&A, or Quanda. Uh, in this episode, the panelists were James Patterson, uh, Victorian Liberal Senator, Kate Ellis, Shadow Minister for Early Childhood Education, Jackie Lambie, uh, she's quite well known now, Independent Senator for Tasmania, Yasmin Abdil... Uh, Megid, founder of Youth Without Borders, and Luco Belgiorno Netis, founder of the New Democracy Foundation. And I'll be providing a link to the episode down below. Uh, everyone should check it out. It was actually a really interesting episode. Uh, I have to give the MVP award to uh, Yasmin Abdel Megid. Uh, she obviously represented uh, views that more closely resembled my own. She was younger seemed to be more left-wing and certainly, from my point of view, more thoughtful about a lot of the issues. And also, Luca Belgiorno Nettis, uh, I don't know anything about the New Democracy Foundation, but I'm going to be checking them out because there were some fantastic radical ideas and some ideas which kind of that he talked about which kind of mirrored my own, which is about involving the general population more in decisions. And um, it's about eliminating the gap between... Uh, you know, the decision makers and the general population and, you know, uh, there's obviously risks to that and there's all kinds of things we can uh, talk about with that and maybe I'll make a video about that in the future, but uh, that's really interesting and I encourage everyone to look into that. But as far as this episode, I wanted to talk about some pretty hot-button uh, topics. Uh, first of all, uh, the Liberal Party, who were represented by James Patterson in this, uh, they started blaming renewables, the renewable sector for the blackouts in South Australia, which once they were pointed out that they weren't responsible for it, he then uh, attenuated his position to be that it didn't, they wasn't responsible for the blackouts, but they exacerbated them. And he said that uh, the problem with renewables is there's no base power load that can be fired up uh, once the power goes down. So yeah, renewables, yeah, whatever, they're fine. But when there's a crisis situation, there's no base power load to be brought up. Tony Jones rebutted and brought up the fact that um, backup power was available, but it was decided by those in power not to implement it. Uh, I believe that uh, the Labour member, uh, Kate Ellis, suggested that that was because of pri privatisation. But um, at this point... Uh, James then changed, he, he avoided he avoided this answer. So Tony Jones said uh, the power was available, but it wasn't used. And then James totally deflected the question, saying, oh, yeah, there's some there, but most of them have been shut down by the Labour and the Greens, and, you know, I'm not using his exact words or paraphrasing correctly, but this was his point, that, that supposed dirty power stations have been shut down by the left, and therefore they couldn't be used. Yeah, but that doesn't explain the power stations that were still available and were not used. It was a complete deflection. Uh, he might have some broader point, uh, especially with regard to jobs, uh, about shutting down of all the coal-fired power plants and the thermal solutions to these issues, but that's it was unrelated to this, and he fa absolutely failed on this point. Um, there was a great discussion with renewables, and particularly about the infrastructure being in place for renewables. And I think it's something that, uh, I mean, in infrastructure is something that I think in general, the left seem much more um, inclined to, in, to at least have, entertain the idea of investing in infrastructure. So uh, the idea of, there's a lot of arguments by, and James made the arguments, uh, the Liberal Party member, that um, the infrastructure or the technology just isn't in place yet. So therefore, we need to still focus on coal and on fossil fuels and to prop up those those industries for jobs. But the issue is the it's it's kind of a self perpetuating cycle here. Is if we don't invest in the infrastructure, then coal will always be the more cost efficient um, uh, uh, form of power and. This is actually, I found this, this has been the debate, and it's kind of been skipped over a lot, talking about the North Dakota uh, access pipeline uh, in America with all the protests going on, where people say, oh, they should have consulted with the Native American tribes. I hope tribes is the right word. Um, or the, you know, because they wanted to go through their land, and, you know, 
sure there was one meeting the Native American representative said no we don't want it and then they didn't have any more meetings after that so all the de- all the debate has been about how there were no meetings even though there was a meeting and none of it was about and, and people even people on the left or it's more they're supposedly the left but it's the center the, you know the, the technocratic center who say oh actually these people are just going to uh, make this is actually bad for the environment. If we build the pipeline, it's good for the environment because otherwise trucks and trains will be taking these things. There'll be more spills and there'll be more um, more pollution because there, there's a greater carbon footprint on transporting the fuel to begin with. But the point is, it's about refusing to invest in fossil fuel infrastructure and instead using that money to invest in renewable infrastructure. So, yeah, short term, we might be making it more expensive for fossil fuels, but that's kind of the point. We want it to be more cost efficient for renewables. And it's the same thing in Australia. It's the same thing why we need to be investing more into renewables to make it more cost efficient. And we can see in America now, I know a lot of mining industry has been shut down in America, a lot of fossil fuel and coal plants, but now in America, fossil fuel, uh, oh, sorry, renewables employ more people. The renewable sector employs more people than the fossil fuel sector. So there's a lot of jobs to be had there as well. And these things have to go hand in hand with retraining and retooling and making sure that the people who work in those industries, you know, can can transition out of those industries, especially into renewables. This is also the topic that Jackie Lambie was, you know, I like Jackie, Jackie Lambie, and she absolutely represents the people. She talks like a real person. And a, a part of the problem with this whole episode was, oh, listening to particularly James, but Kate had this issue as well of it sounded like talking points and it sounded like pre-prepared zingers. Uh, Jackie Lambie just unleashed what she was thinking, and she might have prepared it as well, but this was where she was most incoherent uh, with regard to climate change. She seems to be a climate change skeptic, possibly even a denier, uh, at least that it's it's, um, human-generated climate change. So she's said, climate change happens, a hundred years ago it was four degrees hotter, it goes in cycles, there's nothing we can do to stop it. So she says there's nothing we can do to stop it, then she also says, uh, there's nothing, so I, th- I think what she means is there's nothing Australia by itself can do to stop it. I think that's her point. Um, and the idea is that Australia would only make a small amount of change. And, but and then she says, I also reject the Paris Agreement. And then on the next breath, she says, the entire world needs to act, not just Australia. So her, her point seems to be that Australia by itself can't do this alone. But then she rejects the Paris Agreement, which every country has made an agreement. And then she says, every country needs to make an agreement. It can't just be Australia. It's completely incoherent, makes no sense. And, you know, she looked kind of... She looked a little bit foolish, in my opinion. She looked more foolish there than when she was talking about Sharia, which the Sharia law part was... That was the big the big issue on social media, but we'll get to that later. Um... She did bring up the inter- an interesting point on nuclear power. Now, I'm, I, I, I've read quite a bit about nuclear power. I, it's a great alternative. It's very safe. It actually has less deaths uh, than uh, per you know en- energy de- generated than uh, any other form of power, including renewables. Uh, and most of those deaths came from one incident. But then again, there's ongoing problems in Japan. There, there's all kinds of baggage associated with it. But the problem with nuclear power in Australia, at least, is had we started investing, it's the same thing with infrastructure. There's no infrastructure in place. Uh, we don't have the tools, we don't have the resources, we don't have the people, um, the expertise to really get that industry going anytime soon. So we could start now, but by the time it really starts going, you know, in- infrastructure is already getting to the point where it's about to be the most cost effective, the cost efficient form of generating power. And so my position is that we should focus on renewables. I'm not opposed to nuclear power, and there are some benefits. There are some uh, problems with it too, but you know, if this were the United States, I'd say we need a plan of nuclear and renewables and really phase out fossil fuels, and especially fracking and coal seam gas. But um, yeah, in Australia, it seems less valid. I'm open to the argument, but yeah, I'd, lo- I'd really like to see focus on renewables. All right, the next part of this is about the child care and omnibus bill. There's not too much to say here that wasn't said on the show. Uh, my belief is that child care should be a right for all people. Uh, not only would it promote 
um, greater uh, participation in the workforce. Uh, it would be good for the children. It would also promote equality, I think, between men and women, because women disproportionately take, you know, responsibility for raising the children, even in this day and age. Uh, and so I, I think it's something that should be government provided and not just subsidized. Uh, but this, we're talking very expensive. So I, I don't know the full particulars on that, but that's where we need to be working towards, is what I'm saying. That's what we should be striving for. Now, the Liberal Party, and they were really called out for it on this episode, they were taking the approach that we're going to cut... This is this omnibus bill. They're going to cut benefits to aged care and the, uh, and also uh, f uh, family tax benefits and they're going to be redirecting it, was James Patterson's words, uh, so that people are encouraged, you know, encouraged to go back to work. Uh, but what this really does is it doesn't encourage them, it forces them to go back to work. What actually encourages people is providing uh, childcare. If, if parents don't have to be at home looking after their children, then they can go back to work. Then they can engage in their own personal entrepreneurialism and start their own business, contribute to the economy, they can learn, they can go back to university, they can study, you know, they can become a contributing member of the economy. That's what actually encourages people to work, uh, from my point of view, the way I see it. Um, and obviously we shouldn't be cutting benefits to the poorest and the most vulnerable, we should be expanding them. Uh, and we should be finding other avenues for funding, namely the very wealthiest, the largest corporations. Um, then I guess I can't, I can't, I didn't really want to talk about it in this video, I kind of discussed it a little bit in the last video, which coincidentally came around the same time as this, but we have to talk about Sharia and Islam. Uh, Jackie Lambie, I, I think she doesn't understand what Sharia law is, and Sharia, um, from my understanding of it is that um, it's, Sharia is much more all-encompassing than the, ju 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 the judicial system we hear about with ISIS, with beheadings and things like that. It, it is... Uh, how a Muslim lives their life, basically. And that's the point that, I've forgotten her name, I'll just get it right now, uh, Yasmin brought up, uh, and she, was, she, she, she made an excellent point, and I thought um, Jackie failed on this point as well. She, Jackie was great on other points, but I think she failed on this and on climate change. Um, and Yasmin made a fantastic point about culture being different to religion, and they're kind of interrelated, and they affect one another, but there, you know, there's a de demarcation between the two. Sometimes it's blurred in some areas more so than others. But, and I say this as an atheist who's, you know, a, a, in a general way opposed to all religion, but um, not not to a person's right to um, to um, be religious. Um, she, Yasmin made a tried to make a comment, or she made a comment saying that uh, Islam is the most feminist culture. I believe that's what she said. Uh, and her argument for that was it was the first, really, to prov to provide various forms of equality. Uh, and that was wonderful, and uh, the golden age of Islam, it was certainly the most progressive society in the world. However, modern progressive society has certainly, if it's not at a greater level of equality, it, it, okay, it, it's at a greater level of equality today. Uh, using past precedent doesn't mean that... Um, it is still you know, the highest form of feminism, and there's many many forms in uh, modern society that are not equal, and we do need to work, and we constantly need to be striving towards more equality. But I think religion in general uh, it, uh, has a much worse form of patriarchy involved, and it has that dogma attached to it, which prevents uh, equality in society in general. Um, I wrote down some notes here. Following the law of the land is a great... Oh, yeah, so Sharia is... Well, within Sharia, it's, uh, within Islam, it says you need to follow the law of the land. land. Um, most people who hear that understand that. And most people aren't against the average Australian Muslim. But there's this fear, this moral panic. And um, people really miss this point. So then people shift their argument to, well, it's the um, Islamists who are politically inclined. They don't want to use violence to establish Sharia, but they want to establish Sharia through the court system, or they want to have their own judicial system, uh, which 
you know, I, I'm opposed to that. I'm a, I'm a secularist. I want the separation of church and state. But as far as I'm concerned, the more pressing matter right now is the fact that the Christian right, right now in Australia, especially in America, you know, all around the world, the Christian lobby, the, the Christian uh, influenced politicians are actually affecting our policy right now. There's, they have uh, Malcolm Turnbull's hands tied behind his back. You know, it's the reason why we don't have same-sex marriage in Australia. You know, it's, it's the reason why we don't have euthanasia laws in Australia. We don't have progressive euthanasia laws. We don't have uh, universal uh, pro uh, laws providing uh, safe abortion to women. Uh, so I'm more concerned right now about the Christian right, but I'm opposed to religious influence uh, altogether in government. And I want to bring up a final point about this. And this is the point that, you know, people who criticize Islam, and, you know, I criticize Islam, I criticize all religions, and they're, they're afraid of being called Islamophobic. And Yasmin brought up a great point that it doesn't necessarily make you Islamophobic to criticize you know, uh, these dogmas. Uh, but a lot of the re rhetoric today does resemble 1930s Germany. So I looked into, and that's a shocking statement, and most people be like, I'm not like that. But I I looked into, I recently got into reading about Holocaust denial, just because I was curious about it. And a lot of the things that these people were saying, you know, I was reading posts on social media by Holocaust deniers and these people who you know, they're not even, they're claiming they're not anti-Semitic. And a lot of the arguments they use are exactly the same as a lot of arguments that these people from, these Reclaim Australia types use. Even people like Sam Harris use, and, and I'm a supporter of Sam Harris. Um, and down to things like, you know, in 1930s Germany, they had, I read this article recently, and I should post a link. If I find the link, I'll post it down below. Uh, and it was describing the conditions of Germany as it was taken over by the Nazi party, but it describes them from the point of view of somebody who was living in them. It was written by the, it was written from someone who, who grew up in there, in Germany in the 1930s. And one, like, even things such as, so in this article it talked about how they had stickers saying German firm, meaning you know, this storefront is, a, own, is owned and operated by a German, not a Jew. Uh, so they'd have these. So it, it was all about that nationalism. It was about it was inherently anti-Semitic, and you know we don't have that in Australia today. But there's this press against halal and this this press against you know towards banning Muslims that kind of you know it, people it feels like people are suggesting similar sort of things. And it's not that I don't think those people mean to be mean spirited or mean to be bigoted. It's, it's driven out of fear, and it's driven out of uh, patriotism, and, you know, this, this desire to be good, but when it all accumulates into these systems, that's when it becomes dangerous. So I just wanted to talk about that. Pretty long video today, but I hope people enjoyed it. I'm all about debate, discussion, so if anyone sees this, put a comment down below. Uh, I'll see if I can respond in some way, maybe in a future video. Thank you.